all of us are blessed to have such a leader in President George W. Bush. Thank you, Thank you all. Good job. Thank you all. Please be seated. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Senator Santorum read that just like I wrote it. <laughs> Thanks for coming. I appreciate uh, uh, Senator uh, Rick, I call him Rick, uh, for um, coming over from Washington. Uh, today, the United States Senate uh, did something constructive. They voted uh, to uh, reform class action lawsuits so that frivolous lawsuits won't drive up the cost of doing business in America and so that people... <laughs> And I want to thank you for your leadership on that issue, Rick. I appreciate so very much uh, Karen Stout, the president of Montgomery County Community College, for having us. I want to thank all the professors and students who are here. If you're a younger student here at, at uh, Montgomery Community College, this is a really interesting conversation for you to hear. I mean, it's important that you listen. I want to thank our panelists who are here. I want to thank the county commissioners who are here. Uh, Jim Matthews being the chairman. Appreciate you, Mr. Chairman. Yeah. Lousy seat. Doing a fine job, though. Look, uh, I, I, I love the community college system in America, and i tell you why. Uh, community colleges are flexible, available, and affordable. Community colleges can adjust curriculum to meet uh, the needs of the time. Community colleges are a, as Rick met, mentioned the word hopeful, a really hopeful place for people to gain the skills necessary to fill the jobs in a changing world. And so I asked uh, Karen, I said, have you got anything going on here that's uh, different from the past? She said, quite a few things. We've got a, you know, a biotech curriculum now that uh, will train workers for the jobs which actually will exist. She said, we've got a fantastic nursing program. There's a huge demand for nurses. And, uh, she talked about, you know, medical assisting programs. I mean, there's a lot going on here, which says to me, uh, it speaks to the vitality of an education system that's capable of adjusting to meet needs. And so I want to congratulate those of you who support your community college systems. I'll assure you that I will work with the Congress to see to it there's funding available to make sure people are trained for the jobs which will exist as we head into the 21st century. Thanks for having us. It's a fitting place to talk about the future in a, in a, in a, in a uh, in an institution that is so dedicated to the future. Uh, today when I landed, I met uh, David Bulky. I don't know where David is. I hope you got a better seat than the chairman. There he is. Yeah, you did. <laughs> I'm glad you're here, David. Uh, David is what we call a USA Freedom Corps volunteer. He is a mentor. And the reason I like to herald folks like David is that um, the true strength of America lies in the hearts and souls of our citizens. You really think about it. We're a remarkable country because there are millions of people who are willing to take time out of their busy lives to volunteer to help somebody else. David chose to do so uh, through Big Brothers, Big Sisters, Amachi Mentoring Program. It is a fabulous program. It's one to help um, youngsters whose mom or dad may be incarcerated. It is a necessary program. It is a vital program, and it works because loving people are willing to support it. If you're interested in serving your country, if you want to make your community a better place, feed the hungry, find shelter for the homeless, and surround somebody who hurts with love, just like David Bulky has done. I appreciate the example you've set, and thank you for coming. Before I talk about Social Security, I do want to talk about a few other issues. Uh, you know, when the president gets the mic, I told her, she said, Laura said, where are you headed today? I said, I'm going down to North Carolina, and then I'm going to Pennsylvania. She said, let the panelists talk. <laughs> she knows me well. But I do want to, I do want to talk about what a hopeful, um, how hopeful the world has been recently. There's been some amazing things have happened. Uh, the people of Afghanistan voted for a president. Millions of people went to the polls. After the, uh, after the country was rid of the Taliban, we, we acted in our self-defense in two ways. One, we rid the country of the Taliban that was fostering and providing safe harbor to al-Qaeda, which had attacked our country. 
But we also enhanced our defense by working with that country to promote democracy. Democracy in the part of the world that a lot of folks said, it's just impossible to happen. But I don't subscribe to that kind of doubt or cynicism because I believe deep in everybody's soul is the deep desire to live in freedom. And the Afghan people, when given that chance, I say that our security is more enhanced because democratic societies are peaceful societies. Democracies promote peace as they listen to the hopes and aspirations of their people. And then there was a vote in the Palestinian territory. And I, I want to commend President Abbas for his leadership, his desire to fight off the terrorists so that a democracy can evolve in the Palestinian territories, which will make it more likely we'll have peace with Israel. And of course, the Ukrainian elections were a great inspiration for all. I'm looking forward to meeting President Yushchenko on my trip here to Europe. Uh, I think I'm going a week from today, two weeks from today, soon. <laughs> Before the month is out. <laughs> and then, of course, a week ago Sunday, something amazing happened. That in spite of terror and fear and assassination attempts and threats, millions of people in Iraq went to the polls to say, we will not be intimidated, we want to be free. These are important events. There's incredibly important events. And um, I don't know if you suffered through the State of the Union, but there was an amazing moment where the Iraqi human rights activists who voted and the mom of the fallen Marine hugged, which spoke volumes to me about, one, the appreciation of the Iraqi people for the sacrifices being made on their behalf. And secondly, uh, a mom honoring a fallen soldier, honoring her son, and I hope she realized that, and I hope you all do too, that by having a free society, not only are we more secure in the short run, but in the long run, our children are more likely to grow up in a peaceful world. Freedom is on the march. And for the next four years as your president, I will continue to work with friends and allies to spread freedom and therefore peace around this world. A couple of other things. A couple of other things I want to talk about. Uh, the economy is, 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 is moving. We created 146,000 new jobs in January. The national unemployment rate is 5.2 percent. People are working. The fundamental question is how do we keep it growing? I'm, I'm a big believer in legal reform. Today I mentioned the Senate took a big step. The House will then respond. I hope to be signing the bill relatively quickly. We need to do the same thing for asbestos lawsuits. We need to fix the, the system. Legal reform is an important part of making sure America is the best place in the world to do business and that the small business sector remains strong and the entrepreneurial spirit is vibrant. And so is good budget policy. I submitted a good lean budget to the United States Congress the other day. I've heard from business leaders, both large and small. I've heard from community activists. I've heard from members of both sides. I said, let's do something about the deficit. I said, all right, let's go. And here's a budget. And inherent to that budget is one, government must set priorities. And when government finds programs that aren't working, must have the courage to eliminate them. And that's precisely what our budget does. It's a budget that sets priorities and a budget that makes it clear we will be wiser about how we spend the taxpayer's money. And I expect Congress to pass that budget. We have an obligation to confront problems. And I want to talk about Social Security, which for years has been called the third rail of American politics. If you touch it, you expire politically. <laughs> <laughs> but I believe the, pro the job of the president is to confront problems, not to pass them on, not to say, okay, somebody else will solve it. And so I want to talk about Social Security, just like I did in the State of the Union, and like I will do over and over and over again around this country to make it clear we have a problem. And here's the problem. Rick mentioned it, and I want to, uh, again, say what he said. Baby boomers like me are fixing to retire, and there's a lot of us. 
there's a whole bunch more of us than, than, uh, uh, than perhaps in any other time in our history. And yet we're living longer, and the government has promised us greater benefits than a previous generation. And yet, as Rick mentioned, fewer people are paying in the system. So you can see the math. You've got more people living longer, getting greater promises with fewer people paying for it. Which means in the year 2018, the system starts to go into the red. In other words, more money going out than coming in. Now, one of the myths about Social Security is there's a pile of money sitting there accumulating. You put money in, the government saves it for you, and then when you retire, you get it out. That's not the way the system works. Every dime that goes in from payroll taxes is spent. It's spent on retirees, and if there's excess, it's spent on government programs. The only thing the Social Security has is a pile of IOUs from one, form of, one part of government to the next. This is a pay-as-you-go system. And so, therefore, when you have more retirees living longer for greater benefits with fewer people paying in, the system inevitably will go into the red. In 2018, 13 years down the road, it starts to go negative. And every year thereafter, the situation gets worse. In other words, more money is required to meet the promises. So that by the year 2027, the government's going to have to come up with $200 billion additional dollars above and beyond the payroll taxes to meet promises. And greater the next year, and greater the next year, $300 billion in 30, 30, uh, 2037. Until 2042, it's broke. And that's the dilemma we're faced with. And the fundamental question is, are we willing to confront it? And so my first mission is to travel our country, making it clear to people of all political parties, all demographics, we've got a problem. And you can define it crisis, big problem, whatever you want to define it. All I ask is that you look at the chart. And you can define the problem however you want to define it. If you're a young person who's going to have to tote the bill, I would call it a significant problem. Now, it is not a problem for people who've retired and are near retirement. And so part of the reason I'm going to travel the country is not only to say to folks, we got a problem, and here it is. But if you've retired, the system is in good shape for you. You don't have a darn thing to worry about. I don't care what the ads say. I don't care what the spinners say. You're in good shape. The system will meet its promises to you. And that's an important thing for seniors to hear because I fully understand a lot of seniors rely upon Social Security. There's a lot of folks that count on this very important program in order for them to live. And so for the next weeks, I'll be continually traveling our country, saying two things. One, we got a problem. And two, if you've retired or near retirement, born before 1950, you don't have a darn thing to worry about. The system will meet its promises. Now, once people see there's a problem, the next question is going to be, what are you going to do about it? And I have an obligation to participate in the process. As Rick mentioned, my predecessor, President Clinton, addressed this issue, and there was a lot of interesting ideas that were floated about how to permanently fix Social Security. There's no need to put a Band-Aid on it now. Now's the time. If we're going to address it, we might as well fix it forever. And so he talked about different ideas. And as I said in my State of the Union, all ideas are on the table. If you've got a good idea, whether you're Republican or Democrat, bring it forth. People should feel free to be able to de debate this issue without fear of political reprisal. Now, I've got some ideas myself. And one of the ideas is to allow younger workers to take some of their own money and set up a personal retirement account. The idea is to allow a younger worker to be able to earn a better rate of return on his or her money than that which is being earned as a result of the uh, Social Security money going through the federal government. It's called the compounding rate of interest. I'm not going to try to get on your turf. It's a history major. C student. There's hope for you, C students. There's hope for you. But let me give you an example of the compounding rate of interest. Now, the program that we're suggesting to Congress is that personal accounts start slowly so that we can better fund the transition to personal accounts. And that eventually, though, workers should be able to set 4% of their payroll, or their, uh, their payroll taxes aside in a personal account. So 
assuming that the 4% level is reached, a person earning $35,000 a year over their lifetime, setting aside 4% of the money, and the, with, with the compounding rate of interest, by the time he or she retires, will have a nest egg of $250,000. Now that's a, a capital base from which that person can draw money to supplement his or her Social Security checks she'll be getting, however great that may be. So the personal account will be able to earn money over the course of time at a greater rate than the money that, that the government holds. And that's important. Now, people say to me, what's a personal account mean? Is there, is there, is there an example of a personal account? Tell me, this sounds like a brand new idea. It's not a new idea. If you're a federal employee, you've got what's available, what's called a thrift savings plan that says you can take some of your money and invest it in stocks and bonds. So we've done this before. My view is if it's good enough for federal employees, it ought to be good enough for younger workers. In other words, it's an attractive way for people to build assets. We ought to, in Washington, at least be consistent in our thought. We ought to be fair in our dealings with people. People say, well, what, what, what kind of investments could I invest in? Well, obviously, we're not going to let you take your money and put it in the lottery. That, that would mean you wouldn't have anything left, and I'll do respect to those people running lotteries. Lotteries aren't meant for you to win. <laughs> They're meant for a few people to win at best. <laughs> or you can't take it and shake dice at the local casino to try to enhance your return. In other words, there will be the, 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 the types of investment vehicles you'll be investing in will be regulated. There'll be a conservative mix so that the risk is held down, but the reward is greater than that which is in the Social Security Trust. People say, well, when I, if I'm the 35,000 a year person and I've got the 250,000 upon retirement, can I draw it all out? No, you can't draw it out, all out. It is meant there to supplement your Social Security check. In other words, it is part of a retirement fund. The distinct advantage of this is not only a greater rate of return, it's your own assets. I think there's something incredibly vital about a society in which people own something. And we want more people owning things in America, your own home, your own business, and owning and managing your own retirement account. I think it's a healthy thing for people to be able to have a quarterly statement watching their asset base grow. It certainly would cause people to pay attention to the economic